The Characteristics of Fascism. Action. Alfredo Rocco described fascism at length, but through all of his writings, he had a very clear and succinct description of the ideology. Fascism is, Rocco wrote in 1925, above all, action and sentiment, and that such it must continue to be. An ethos of action is at the heart of fascism, and indeed informs the fascist positions around foreign policy, economic policy, anti-liberalism, anti-democracy, and anti-individualism. Rocco was not alone in this belief. Mussolini, Giovanni Gentili, the Japanese militarists, and even Adolf Hitler were all enamored by the romantic notion of action above all else. Part of the reason it had been difficult to just categorize fascism as an ideology is this inherent emphasis upon action. Part of the reason that the fascists borrowed heavily from across the political spectrum was their belief that they were the true pragmatists. The fascists directly acknowledged that they borrowed heavily from other political doctrines. They acknowledge it proudly. Rocco writes, quote, the originality of fascism is due in great part to the autonomy of its theoretical principles. For even when, in its external behavior and in its conclusions, it seems identical with other political creeds, in reality it possesses an inner originality due to the new spirit which animates it and due to an entire, entirely different theoretical approach." Unquote. According to their vision, the fascists were eminent pragmatists, only seeking that which works and executing those policies in the name of the people. If the fascists borrow from liberalism or socialism, so be it. It does nothing to undermine its consistency because at least the fascists are doing something to help the nation. Rocco writes, Fascism never raises the question of methods, using in its political praxis now liberal ways, now democratic means, and at times even socialistic devices. This indifference to method often exposes fascism to the charge of incoherence on the part of the superficial observers, who do not see that what counts with us is the end, and that therefore, even when we employ the same means, we act with a radically different spiritual and strive for entirely different results." Unquote. Not only was action inherently virtuous, even if it led to mistakes or errors, it was still better than endlessly deliberating. Rocco writes, quote, To the existence of this ideal co content of fascism, to the truth of it, this fascist logic, we ascribe the fact that though we commit many errors in detail, we very seldom go astray on fundamentals, unquote. Though the fascists acknowledge that they may, they may make mi mistakes and go astray from strict ideological strictures, they claimed that it was nevertheless virtuous to be doing something as opposed to endlessly arguing. Giovanni Gentili writes, quote, Fascism prefers not to waste time constructing abstract theories about itself, unquote. This is part of its opposition to liberalism and democracy. One must not waste time deliberating and focusing on archaic philosophy when the people are in need. According to the fascists, their philosophy is built out of utmost practicality. Mussolini writes, quote, My doctrine, even in that period, had been a doctrine of action. Fascism was not given out to the wet nurse of a doctrine elaborated beforehand round a table. It was born of the need for action, unquote. The ideology was not hashed out in libraries or debated in smoke-filled beer halls. It did not rely upon the near-endless research and the writing of treatises that other ideologies are based upon. Mussolini writes that for fascism, quote, the foundations of the doctrine were laid while the battle was raging, unquote. This sense of pragmatism of building the ideology on the field of battle is part of the reason fascism promulgated so many ideological inconsistencies. Despite these inconsistencies, the fascists themselves insisted that their vision was nevertheless unique and holistic. For the time being, fascism was willing to borrow from their competitors, but ultimately it would blossom into its own unique flower.
Mussolini writes that fascism was, quote, destined later, after a few years, to develop into a series of doctrinal attitudes, which made a fascism a self-sufficient political doctrine able to face all others, unquote. For the fascists, their ideology was not merely a series of political postulations. Rather, it was a way of life. Gentili writes that, quote, The political doctrine of fascism is not the whole of fascism. It is rather that its, emo its more prominent aspect and in general its uh, most interesting one, unquote. While politics was immensely important to fascism, it ultimately sought to build communities in their own image. Further, fascism was the only way for a community to achieve a holistic and genuine sense of identity. Action was a key part of this identity. Mussolini writes, quote, Fascism desires an active man, one engaged in activity with all of his energies. It conceives of life as a struggle, thus for the single individual, thus for the nation, thus for humanity, unquote. The new fascist man that they sought to promulgate was not a weak-willed Democrat nor a fainting liberal. He would do what was necessary when it was necessary. With this heightened sense of action and the seeking to build a holistic community, one can see how the cult of action at all costs also sought to undermine the civil society. For the fascists, everything becomes political. There is no consideration that can, society can exist outside the state. For the fascists, society and the state are one and the same. As a result, every action has a political meaning, regardless of how inane it may seem. Mussolini writes, quote, no action can be divorced from moral judgment, unquote. By devoting oneself to action, by imbuing all of life with some form of political importance, the fascist society would be the ultimate and freest society. Gentili writes, quote, If by system or philosophy we mean a living thought, then fascism is a perfect system, unquote. The Japanese largely agreed with these sentiments, particularly when considering their cultural ideals. The ideals of the Bushido Code line up very well with the contentions of Mussolini and Gentili. For the Japanese, quote, a samurai was essentially a man of action, unquote. The noble samurai must be prepared to act, to do what must be done in the name of his honor and the honor of the emperor. Furthermore, action played heavily into fascist conceptions of how history progressed and was formed and how the future would be shaped. Mussolini wrote that, quote, outside history, man is nothing, unquote. Human beings cannot be considered to be human beings if they are acting in a vacuum. Indeed, a human being acting in a vacuum would be impossible. The same goes for whole communities and civilizations. This sense of action forming all of history connects very directly to fascism, fascism's inherent militarism and the belief that only the strong can survive, and write the histories of the future. Historian Jorge Dagnino observes that for the fascists, quote, life itself was a permanent war and had to be combated with the disciplined spirit of a soldier, removing any trace of compassion that could weaken the nation's might, unquote. So it must always be and always will be. The civilizations willing to act and do what must be done to preserve themselves will be the one, only ones remembered, let alone worth remembering. Hitler, in his writings, also echoed these sentiments about national and racial conflict shaping the course of history. Hitler writes, quote, Only force rules. Force is the first law. A struggle has already taken place between original man and his primeval world. Only through struggle have states and the world become great. If one should ask whether this struggle is gruesome, then the only answer could be, for the weak, yes. For humanity as a whole, no. Unfortunately, the contemporary world stresses internationalism instead of the innate values of race, democracy and the majority instead of the worth of the great leader, unquote. Unlike Marxism with its class struggle shaping history, Hitler believes racial or national struggles shape history. Nevertheless, both conceptions of history are fundamentally Hegelian. Thesis and antithesis must always come into violent blows to form synthesis, 
If one wishes to be the writer of history, one must be victorious, and the victor is invariably the one who acts first. This also connects to the fascist propensity to aggressive wars of conquest as opposed to defense. There has been a consistent argument in many analyses of fascism that fascism is inherently anti-intellectual and anti-modern. Giovanni Gentili stated as much when he wrote that, quote, fascism is eminently anti-intellectual, eminently Mazzinian, and that is, if by intellectualism we mean the divorce of thought from action. Fascism is hostile to all utopian systems which are destined never to face the test of reality, unquote. Gentili's sense of anti-intellectualism being directly connected to the ideal of action is important to keep in mind. Some analysts misinterpret this idea of anti-intellectualism. Quote, Kitchen, for instance, argues that fascism was in essence the reverse image of modernization. And Turner, focusing on the German experience, says that Hitler wished to create an anti-modern utopia, unquote. This argument ought to be broken down, as one element of it does not carry much water. The idea that fascism was anti-modern in any sense does not hold up under scrutiny. The idea that the fascists were anti-intellectual deserves deeper analysis. It cannot mean that they were against education or intellectual pursuits. This is particularly the case when one considers that there were many highly educated people at the center of the movement. Giovanni Gentili was a philosopher and a professor. Joseph Goebbels had a PhD in German philology from Heidelberg University. On his own time, he had an active interest in drama, poetry, literature, and even wrote an expressionist novel. Alfredo Rocco was a lecturer in commercial law at the University of Urbino. Rocco also worked at the University of Maserata and was a full professor at the universities of Parma and Pal Palermo. Between 1910 and 1925, Rocco taught business law at the University of Padua. Philosopher, writer, professor, and university president Martin Heidegger famously supported the Nazis and helped them to reform the university system in Germany. He is described as one of the most important philosophers in the 20th century. He, quote, exerted an enormous influence on virtually every other humanistic discipline, including literary criticism, criticism, hermeneutics, psychology, and theology, unquote. Famously, the NASA space program got its start by recruiting former Nazi rocket art engineers in Project Paperclip. Werner von Braun was a brilliant engineer who built rockets that the Nazis used to bombard London throughout the Second World War. Later, he became an extremely influential member of NASA. The list goes on and on. There were many intellectuals amongst the core members of the fascist movements, engineers, doctors, lawyers, professors, teachers, etc. Given this evidence, it is apparent that anti-intellectualism is not the same as anti-education or an anti-intellectual exercise. What was meant by anti-intellectualism was deeply connected to the idea of action. Cohen observes that the irrationalist tradition in philosophy, quote, urges the abandonment of intellect as the ideal ruling faculty in political affairs and its replacement by some non-intellectual function, sentiment, inspiration, passion, intuition, force, will, unquote. These ideas fit well into the philosophies of Georges Sorel and Friedrich Nietzsche, both of, both, who both were strong influences on the fascist movement. It is true that they suppressed academic freedom and persecuted those who disagreed with them, but that is not a unique feature of fascism, as communist regimes the world over have done the same thing. It should be undeniable that at the core of fascism is a cult of action, of doing what needs to be done, the consequences be damned. One result of this creed of action is that it appealed to youth, as can be seen in the growth of youth programs, as well as how many young people were among the earliest backers of the fascist cause. Another result of this creed was that the fascists consistently claimed to be pragmatists, merely seeking that which works, regardless of ideology. They worked for the people. They had no time to host a debate club in a library.